Well, hi, everybody. Welcome back to another excellent episode of Ship Talk. I'm Robbie, the host, and I'm very excited to be joined by fellow Yellow Jacket and fellow Greater Atlanta resident, Ken. Uh, Ken, maybe a quick introduction uh, about yourself, Ken. All right. Yeah, thanks a lot, Robbie. Good to see you today. Uh, Ken Aaron's here. I am uh, one of the co-founders and CEO of SpeedScale. Uh, we're a technology startup, SaaS a company headquartered in the greater Atlanta area. Most of our teams here on the on the East Coast. Uh, and I'm just very excited to be on the uh, podcast today. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Kenny. Always excited to be talking to a fellow Yellow Jacket. And we, we were we were talking before this and we left, we actually live really close to each other, which is like, oh, like <laughs> similar, similar life paths. So yeah, very excited. So on, on the uh, issue or not issue, but just journey of life path, Ken, you have a super interesting background. Like, you know, we, it's, Kind of intertwined with companies I worked at before, but maybe uh, you know you you were in some really cool spaces like really early on. You get to see a lot, especially in the observability space. But maybe a couple of, like a minute or two just about your journey and just how did you end up uh, at Speedscale? Yeah, sure. Um, it's it's funny about half my career, Ravi, has been in the in the production side of the world, um, mostly around performance problems, right? And the most common question is, why is this thing so slow? What you know, yeah. why is it falling over? And um, you know, how do we get it back up and running? And I worked at uh, for many years at a company called New Relic. And uh, actually, really early in my career, I started a company called Wiley Technology, which was the first Java monitoring system. And I got a great appreciation for keeping things running in production. And the other uh, kind of half of my career has been in the pre-production space, literally working on the same problem, which is we want to ship this code and we want to make sure that we don't embarrass ourselves right after we click the button, right? Yeah. And uh, we don't want it to blow up when it reaches production. It's the other side of the same problem. And um, I worked at, uh, at one startup called ITKO. We built a set of technology called service virtualization, which was about simulating your dependencies for your code. If you could simulate your backend dependencies, it, uh, it would allow you to test things a lot better and find issues earlier. And uh, now at SpeedScale, we're revisiting some of that space and helping people um, do traffic-driven testing so that they can find their bugs by using their existing traffic from production and recreate uh, the production conditions in non-prod. If you can do that, you got a shot at finding this performance issue earlier. Yeah, it's a, it's a tale as old as time. Um, it, it goes back to like dev, prod, parity. Like production will always have more firepower. And even, you know, I, it's, I really like the fact that you worked at like Computer Associates or Wiley, like, Way back early in my career, I used to write too much Java. And so I was, I used to work for IBM on the web server application server team was. So it's like where that Java gets turned into HTML. I'm used to have a product called Was Profiler. And I would be like, Wiley's better. You know, like it's just a better tool, you know, yeah. for this type of profiling, right? So kudos sitting you know, with you know, on the CA team. And uh, it's always like you never have the firepower in your machine, right? Like, you know, we're constrained. Like I could have like a local version of Was or today, like I might have a K3D cluster, you know, running on my MacBook Pro. Um, but it's no, you know, that, that level of scale is like nowhere near we've gotten better. And, and this is that where you're talking, you know, love to talk about your experience, like, Hey, parity wise, Kubernetes is Kubernetes, but there's still the infrastructure card to play. Like clearly your, you know, your GKE or EKS cluster is bigger and it has better or more dedicated, uh, like, let's say firepower or, or virtualization versus like, Hey, you know what? I have like Spotify, Zoom. Slack, which I can't close for some odd reason on my, yeah. machine, you know, which, um, which is taking up resources versus like, hey, you know, we have a, you know, a a, a t t three XL on AKS, right? Like, which is like very or EKS, which is fairly powerful, and so, uh, yeah, that's an interesting problem. Like, have you seen that problem? You know, parity go away, get get better, get worse. Like, these are the some of the fundamentals on these things just don't go away. Well, I, I think you bring up a really good point. And I would say containerization has uh, been a huge improvement in this area. So if you go back to the WebSphere days, you'd have yeah. to get a really specialized server, um, mm -hmm. you know, and you've got to get a 64 CPU server and you got to get an enormous amount of memory in this kind of thing and figure out all the magic Java flags so it could use all the memory on the server. And so what you had on your desktop at the time didn't compare. Um, when with the shift to containers, 
things can be made in equivalent um, container sizes. So you can say, look, this container is going to take half a CPU and it's going to take 500 megs of RAM, and that's what we're going to give it. And that'll be the building block that we want to go um, and design our infrastructure around. Kubernetes has made this dead simple to say, give me uh, four replicas of that. And if they look like they're falling behind, just increase them, right? Use the uh, pod auto scaler and give me some more uh, replicas. And uh, this has been a great innovation so that uh, it's easier to scale this thing up because it's much harder to go and buy a 64 CPU server than it is to scale up a couple of these small containers. And yeah. from the unit economics of those, that container should, should run really similar in every type of infrastructure. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So like the, the layers have gotten more ubiquitous. And so we could say like, hey, like, you know, if, we, if I'm running like, you know, let's say Docker, like run, like uh, uh, just some sort of image we bake together and like, you know, we, it should respect the CPU limits and whatnot. And then we can just like extrapolate that saying, hey, you know, I, I made a container spec of, you know, four gigs of memory and like two vCPU and like here's some like storage and then that translates to Kubernetes like hey go place this piece of work somewhere on your cluster somewhere and and that, that's gotten better yeah totally and it's, it's still at some point like you know like like because there's there is parity you, you can assume things might might with with an asterisk scale though nearly right saying hey you know yeah, yeah. add another you know add plus one you know when we're doing capacity planning hey I was able to like run a load test on my machine and I was able to run Gatling or some other tool like successfully or like the good old like like J meter like date myself now like um, like <laughs> hey we're able to run like n number of tests we get response time similar to this you know we we assume back of napkin math like with with production like infrastructure we can do do xyz versus like you know it, as we both know it, it doesn't a lot of times it doesn't scale scale linearly you'll run to odd bottlenecks uh, sometimes like, hey, like, you know, why, why is like our network through network throughput not where it should be? Or like, well, because there's two handshakes and two, like these are little things that yeah, you, you got know, it really come up. But uh, yeah, like, you know, you that that's always that's probably been around for the dawn of time. You know, like if, you know, if you go back to our university days, we had to log into a main like, you know, at some point log into a mainframe. Like, why? You know, I used to question that in my CS classes. Like, I do it on my Java, Java. I do it on my, you know, Windows machine. I don't log into a mainframe. But there's a reason why you do that, right? You want to access remote resources. So as, as time as time goes on, right, like. You, know, you find an interesting problem to solve, but like I, I'm I'm cheating because I know you're a founder and it's like, oh, I can ask like founder, you know, for those who don't know Ken, you know, Ken, Ken's been through Y Combinator. Like, how do I know a problem is worth solving, right? And yeah. Like, you and I both have similar problems. Our backyards would flood, but clearly, you know, we'll get yelled at. The house is getting wet. So that's clearly a problem worth to solve immediately. Uh, but let's say for technology or business problems, like how do you know when, <laughs> just when do you want to solve it or how do you want to solve it? Yeah, so it's um this is this is a really good question, Robbie. And actually, when you're when you're first starting your startup, uh, the temptation is let's go and grab the latest technology and go build a prototype, and let's go and build something interesting and get get uh, get someone's feedback and opinion on it. And actually, you should spend some time hovering around the problem. And um, a lot of people talk about product market fit, which is how you know that um, you know. People are excited about using your product and they take it out of your hands. There's a bunch of different signals uh, to get uh, product market fit. But actually before that is problem market fit. Yeah. And problem market fit is people agreeing that this is an important problem and a problem worth solving. And uh, if you were to sit back and say, uh, I want to solve a problem related to, like, let's just say, like CPU related performance and this kind of thing. People would laugh you out of the room probably because they'd say, mm -hmm. I can use Kubernetes. I can use cloud services. This mm -hmm. whole kind of having to get a bunch of CPUs to run a workload is a solved problem. I have a, I have yeah. a ton of choices. But if you ask people things like, are you uh, happy with the performance of your applications? Well, uh, companies like... Datadog and New Relic and AppDynamics uh, and their level of popularity. I don't want to leave anyone off, by the way, Grafana and Dynatrace, yeah. and we won't we won't ever end. The podcast will run out of time. <laughs> the popularity of these tools is proof that people care a lot about these performance problems and that they haven't gone away. Uh, and so 
having access to near infinite CPU appears to have not solved that. Um, <clears throat> That's where we ended up uh, starting with a, with a part of our problem, but you have to talk to people, get feedback. How do you solve this? Do you agree that this is a real problem? Uh, uh, how do you solve it today? Are you happy with the solutions you use today? It's super uncomfortable. <laughs> Uh, you know, talking to talking to users and finding them, and and uh, but that discovery is is mission critical, so that you hone in on a really important problem to solve. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that, that's very very great advice. Uh, I'll also cheat. Uh, I'll 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 kind of not pivot, but like let's like personify like like a let's say a listener. You know, usually it's like a DevOps engineer, a platform engineer. One of the things, um, love to get your take. It's it's a, a lot of it's similar to like starting your own business. Uh, but let's say that, you know, 10, 15 years ago, like DevOps is just coming of age, you know, like companies were maybe like assigning like a person, you know, to like DevOps or platform engineering, or even, you know, it's funny, like, oh, I need someone with 20 years Kubernetes experience. Well, it's impossible because it came out in 2014, you know, yeah, like, yeah. That, that's kind of impossible. Um, but, you know, and, and let's say the next big thing or the currently big thing is like artificial intelligence. I'll use a buzzword here so we get some more SEO with the, with the podcast. But it, like the same parallels as you were starting your own firm, like if we were to empathize and say, hey, you know, there, there's one more net new piece of tech and like there's a, there's a challenge that's out there or like there's a new piece of technology or, or look at there's some sort of people problem, process problem, technology problem. Like going back to solving a problem, like, hey, like how do I know, like, can I have a very specific job in my company figuring this out. Like I, I'm the first DevOps engineer, you know, 15 years ago versus I'm now like a manager or VP of DevOps. Like, how do you know it's time, it, the time is right to make the investment. So like super cheat here, cause you've been through it. Like you're literally scaling your own company, but I imagine you work for somebody else and you have to make those same decisions. Like how do you know the time is right to invest or not invest in a problem? To invest on uh, developing these skills and learning things. You know, I got to tell you, Ravi, you, yeah. you're literally hitting one of my one of my, uh, you know, items that that I feel passionate about. Mm -hmm. is, uh, so when you're building a company, you've yeah. got to hire people. You can't do it on your own and you have to find the right folks. And you have to have this balance between what are the most important uh, criteria for this position. Right. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about a technical role. Right. So you could have someone on one hand who has all of the technical skills. Uh, and they're fantastic. You have someone on the other hand who's incredibly enthusiastic, but they have no technical skills at all, right? And the ideal person has the, has has this good mix of both, because uh, you cannot train people. At least when you're at a startup, for mm -hmm. example, you need a lot of time out of people. Sometimes uh, you got to go above and beyond. Sometimes you got to work on the weekend. Sometimes a customer is asking a question, you got to jump right in. And so that enthusiasm and willingness uh, to jump in is critical. On the other hand. If you just get enthusiastic people who don't know anything about technology, it won't. It's it's not helpful. So you look for people who want to learn the new thing, okay? And they say, "Oh, I picked this up," and maybe they picked something up and it didn't work. And then maybe they tried some technology. And I remember working with a guy. He tried every single Java add-on thing, and he learned yeah. uh, he learned Groovy, and he ran JRuby, and he ran Tomcat, and he ran every type of app server, you know, and that kind of thing. But he always was able to pick up any new technology very quickly because he was in this constant state. So I wouldn't worry as much about uh, you know should I learn it or not learn it. It's just figure out the anchor ones you're going to build around. We decided Kubernetes when we were starting the company, yep. um, but we don't hire just on Kubernetes skills because we believe we can train that, but we cannot train um, you know, enthusiasm. We can't train people who have some of these core engineering capabilities as well. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. Like, like that applies to anything. So let's say that we'll make something up like foo. Foo, foo is a new technology. And, and it's it's actually very true. Like when you're building something for the first time, or like it's, it's, there's no playbook, right? And so yeah, yeah, there's no playbook. Yeah, there's no you know like IBM Red Book or like there's no manual how to do this. Now there's like like in the Kubernetes space, it's getting more mature. So you might get an O'Reilly book or Manning book or Packet book or whatever funny animal or persons on those books, you know, like and you buy it like Kubernetes in action or you know like platform engineering <laughs> applied. <laughs> what are those those cool books are called these days? But it, it, that's it. Like in a in a you know in a crypto type of space or like a newer paradigm, like you know you 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 look for people who are willing to for the challenge. 
ironically, like shameless self plug for my team, like we're doing stuff for the first time. We're for harness. So like the, we're, my team is chartered with doing things for the first time that harness has never tried before. And that's exactly the similar profile I hire for. Like, are you like, are yeah. you hungry? Are you enthusiastic? Like it takes a lot of gas, you know, like there's no book how to do this. And so like, we are writing the book, right. As we go along, like yeah, exactly for, right. For future like rendition to the team or like future rendition to this gets bigger in the marketplace. And so like, Hey, like it, it's, it's going to push you, uh, you know, in like both ways, technically and create like, Hey, you know, like a lot of times, Hey, is this right? Like, don't know if that's right or not. Like my, as, as a manager, you know, I, I give that coaching saying it looks right to me, but we'll need to let it run for a little bit. Then we get the data similar to all the monitoring stuff, right? Like let's, let's, you know, measure, cut, re reevaluate the, the good old saying, like, you know, measure twice, cut once. Like when you're building, like you need to cut. You know, like you have yeah, to yeah. cut at some point, you know, like measure, measure halfway, cut a little bit, me measure again. Like, you know, that's, that's the, the I would say the, not that the, the, it says the founder's dilemma, but also it's like any sort of thing you're doing for the first or second time was like the builder's dilemma. There we go. My, my manager says that. So he's like, we, we're and in the builder's dilemma right now. For what we're I think you're right, Ravi. So it depends on what you're trying to optimize for. So when you get to a really big uh, scale of company, you have a really good understanding of the methodologies and systems that work and you have a run book. Yeah. And the person you hire is actually the person who can operationalize this run book and execute it in the best way. And what you're looking for in that person is really different. When you want to write the run book, you might have to uh, get someone who is more creative, but their execution could not be at that same level. Yeah. So no person has all these perfect criteria, as our recruiters are always reminding me. Uh, I say, no, I need someone who has all of these things. OK, so after the unicorn, <laughs> yeah. you know, who's the realistic person? But when you're building stuff and this and you're building it for the first time, creativity, come up with a new idea, try something different. Um, you know, and by the way, the other thing I, I keyed off on what you just said, ship it, yeah. right? So it's like, it's time to make a decision. The me we, we can measure it forever. We're going to measure it for a little bit and then cut it and let's ship. And then, and then you can come back and go, okay, that was really terrible. Why'd we do it so fast? Or you go, hey, I'm glad, I'm glad we should have hit the button earlier. Yeah. You get that feedback. Cause like, even like, like negative feedback is still a feedback. You're, you're validating did it fit? Did it not fit? Are people like, like even bad feedback, it's very valuable. Like cherish that because someone's taking the time to like think through it. They might bring a different lens, you know, like I'm so like hyper, like my team is so hyper-focused on delivering stuff. It's like, hey, they're so worried about getting bad feedback. It's like, look, look we'll, we'll get it. Like that means we're, we're impacting people. We people say these things, right? We didn't, not like lack of trying, uh, you know, but we'll have to, you know, since there's no book in how to do it, like we did it for the first time. Yeah, um, yeah. And anyway, nobody nobody uh, has this perfect track record, right? And of course, if you follow any kind of sports analogies and stuff, no one just sits down and, uh, you know, has a perfect basketball game and scores every single time. You miss, right? That's why you got to yeah. rebound. You got to do other stuff, too. So but if you never take shots, for sure, you can't win. Uh, it's, it's very simple stuff, but you it's easy to get caught up in it. This thing's got to be perfect. And so definitely I like one of those, uh, you know, that, that advice from Y Combinator, ship your yeah. product and you might, you, it's okay if you're a little embarrassed and if you're not embarrassed, then you waited too long. Yeah. Um, very true. Yeah. yeah. If, you, if you don't have that uneasy feeling, something's not right. You know, like, yeah, yeah. everything's easy. I used to, if one of my, as my my biggest if i were to ask myself like what was one piece of advice i'd give my own self it's like when i was when i was like much more junior like a, like a like a starting my engineering career i used to get things right all the time like the first time like now i i know if i get it right the first is wrong i'm like there's no way like this works like like if so the understanding like hey like when you do something for the first time it's probably wrong right but like how yeah, do you for sure the you build for the vanilla path versus like i built I, when i engineer something now I build for failure first. I don't build for success first versus like, oh, it's always going to work. Like no one's ever going to type that in. It's like, like why? <laughs> you know, like, Turns out users have their own ideas. Yeah. <laughs> like, if we just cut you the users you know. out, you know, then it'll be super stable. Like our platform. So nice. So just one quick, quick change of gears. Um, Kubernetes has been out for a long time. Like this is, you know, this is your, this is decade now we're coming up on, like since it hit, at least GitHub, you know, in 2014, just, uh, you know, as a person who's been in that industry for a while, like it, wh what's, what's still a challenge? Like, you know, like a lot of things you, you would think everything will be solved by now a decade in, but what, what do you still seem as like, Hey, you know what people are still, regardless of like their size or scale, like you can be one person, a hundred people, like 
what are people kind of kind of struggle on? This this is a very good question, Ravi, because um, clearly the uh, what's what's so we're on Kubernetes. I don't know which version now, one dot thirty, one dot twenty nine, something like that. Um, yeah. I, I could be off, by the way, and now your whole podcast is messed up. But uh, so, I think we're on one two nine. One three zero could have came out. Like this is. But, <laughs> but uh, um, so and and there's three releases a year. There's a lot of releases, yeah. a lot of functionality. It's not yeah. a technical problem, by the way. So a lot of the technical surface area is fairly well solved. Uh, there's a few things that are not ideal. You go, no, the storage of uh, my local data is kind of not the way I want it to be. But by the way, it's all pluggable. So you, you don't like it, go put another uh, mm -hmm. vendor system in there. I think actually where Kubernetes is right now, the biggest problem is ease of use. So um, in a, you, you have to balance these two kinds of users, the superpower users who say, I need another kind of secret that's just like the secret, but a little different for my use case. I'm just you know picking on some piece of infrastructure. Yeah. Secrets are something to complain about because they get stored in plain text, so it's not a great secret. So you have to customize it anyway. Um, and then someone on the other end of the spectrum who's like, I've got my Nginx workload. How can I quickly get it into a cluster without being overwhelmed by all the technology? And the, the approaches I've seen so far haven't worked that great. So things like running Kubernetes on your desktop actually is kind of hard. And when Apple moved to the ARM Max, uh, which has you know, been a while now, it's been three or four years, well, that threw everything through a loop because now all the containers have to be compiled for it. Uh, so, so now running Minikube or some other uh, local desktop is a little bit harder. Uh, mm -hmm. It's all solved, by the way. Uh, it's it's uh, it's done and shipped. And then on the on the cloud infrastructure side, uh, Google launched an interesting product called GKE Autopilot, which will automatically configure. They were working on this ease of use problem, yeah. but it's also hard to use. Uh, so in a in a weird way, by giving you less things to configure and less features, they've actually taken away part of the uh, power usage that you might want at your fingertips. So I'm hopeful that someone will be able to come up with uh, some some easier to use uh, approaches. And and then the the whole I have a PaaS that's built on top of Kubernetes, and I will make a PaaS out of Kubernetes for you. I think has the wrong shape as well. That people need to know how to use the underlying infrastructure. It's just got to get easier, um, you know. Uh, so uh, that and then YAML, because if you have one extra space in your YAML, Ravi, your 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 life is sad. <laughs> yeah, it's like I'm not good at spaces. I'm a tab person because I can't count. I remember, oh lordy, like it's a you have like it's it's space separated, and I had to use like a linter to put like little periods so I can like count like number of like oh this one has four on the left, this one has. It's three. the worst. Robbie, it's, it's the worst. It's so hard. Uh, and then you're like, if you're ever working with someone who's not a Kubernetes expert and you're just trying to help them with their cluster and you're like, let's edit this file. And they're like, I'm using VI right now. We're all going to be okay. And no, it's like, no, yeah. Put an extra space and make it like the line before. They're like, what's happening? That could be easier. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's 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 funny. Like I remember the first time I saw Kubernetes was it was actually before Kelsey Hightower's Kubernetes the hard way. That was like at Red Hat. It was like in 2014. And someone was like, hey, like, look at this Kubernetes thing. I'm like, what? Well, I don't know what that is. And one of the, the more principal essays on my team, like, he installed it on like a remote rel instance. And he had like hundreds of steps. Like, we need this networking NTP protocol enabled here. They need to communicate here. Here's all the, you know, the permissions. I'm like, huh? Now I can just do like mini cube up, you know, or start. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's very true. I mean, you're you're not you're not wrong, Ravi. The yeah. infrastructure side um, is in a tremendously better place. Uh, and and I'll actually say I've I've tested uh, as many Kubernetes distributions uh, as I can get my hands on. So I've run them in AWS and of course in Google Cloud um, in Azure and. Um, a couple that I like, actually, DigitalOcean, very simple, cheap to run if you're on a low budget. Mm -hmm. So you can get a small cluster, and it's actually very simple to get up and running. You fill out one form and hit enter, and you got it. And then there's also um, there's also a couple specialty Kubernetes only um, you know distributions as well. So I think on the infrastructure side where you don't have to configure it, that part is good. But on the application side, it still I think has a little room for improvement to get just the easy button uh, version out there. And Rancher was the closest to it until they got um, you know 
uh, acquired and, and there has not been as much development on, uh, on, on Rancher, but I think, um, I think that's an area for, for the next couple of years. It's not around the functionality. The functionality is fantastic, by the way. Yeah. It has your compute, your storage, your network, all tied in and all the little details you want. Configurations in there, secret management's in there, customization is in there. So um, it's, it has a really fantastic shape and much better than if you were trying to do the same thing using regular cloud services. It's um, So there's a, there's a ton I like about it. I would just like to make it a little easier for everybody. Yeah, definitely a lot of options. Like kind of like my background is like software engineer, Forced into platform engineering, then I left after that. I'm like, yeah, I'll do I'll do architecture type of stuff now. Um, it's it exposes a lot of complexity very quickly because um, yeah. everything is like going back to our favorite YAML. Like you you can configure like all the layers that you need. You can configure your storage. You can configure your networking. You can configure how that like you know what the how the application even starts. You can you can discern certain steps in there. Um, and it's like, not everybody has all those skills. Like my biggest outage of all time was networking related in my career. I blocked half the internet from fraud because they want to look at it. Yeah, it was, it, it was bad. It was, I didn't know what a cider was, but now I do. That was like a drink, you know, yeah. Yeah, like hard cider. Nope. <laughs> they, they have math. <laughs> I divided by, uh, 32 instead of 16, or I did the opposite. I divided by 16 instead of 32. It doesn't matter, Ravi. It's an impossible to solve problem. Uh, there's a, there's no way to know how to configure a CIDR correctly. So for, for what it's worth, the only thing that you can do is put it in and get two different opinions. And then if everyone agrees, then ship it. Yeah. 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 It's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, like I'm like pretty sure like a, anybody who never used reach would tell me I did it wrong. And, but yeah, it was, it was all about like, we were the first app going to AWS. And it was like, well, the networking team who you know, racks and stacks like F5 will be like, we're not looking at it because it's not, you know, it's not on-prem. And it was always like, this. it's a, Kubernetes makes like all these expertises or like even like, you know, post Kubernetes systems, uh, post k I would say, like it exposes a lot of like expertise, like on a level playing field. So like, even though you and I might not know storage, you know, the CSI, like container storage interface YAML, like at least is human readable. You say, oh yes, this is you know they're using a you know a ext4 driver. I don't know what that means. I think that's a storage thing, ext4. I think, you know, <laughs> but, but I, I think you're right, Robbie. It does make it pretty simple. You just say this workload needs some storage, and I can make a storage, and I can see it that it's there. It's yeah. it's it's uh, that has a nice shape to it. Of course, you then run into the next the secondary problem, which is. Uh, storage doesn't run in every availability zone, right? So yep. it's only in one place. And I go, oh, I actually, my cluster is multi-availability zone. Yeah. So those are some of the things to make it easier. That's kind of what actually part of what I'm referring to. We run stateful uh, workloads, you mm -hmm. know, database workloads in our clusters. And that's a common problem we have. So when, uh, when they have to get cycled, these databases are allowed to be cycled. If they come up in the wrong availability zone, then it can't connect to its own storage. So we had to solve that problem. And it's like, why does this problem exist? <laughs> you know, so uh, that's an opportunity I think the Kubernetes folks can can uh, come up with. And I, there's probably, by the way, some vendor solution I'm not aware of. And if there yeah. is, please email it to me and I'll take a look at your stuff. I take a look at almost everybody's stuff because nice. I learn. Yeah, it's always so odd when something Kubernetes fails because it's like usually they can't place to work. It's like very, very odd. Like the failures are like, like it's just like the cluster didn't go away. You know, like if once it starts, it'll just be like, I can't place this work. I can't place this work. I'm like, oh, um, but because I needed like multi, you know, the infrastructure, it can't find like, oh, like multi, you know, some sort of cert, like storage space that will be able to say, oh, because of this claim, I can place it on storage that has like multi-region like it's hard like getting to that level of detail like i could i mean i would see like oh the, i have to restart 50 times i don't know why <laughs> that's that's <laughs> true i think on, in the application space it's very safe that's actually my favorite thing about kubernetes yeah. is you know i'm a human being i write my applications i don't know how the thing's going to run over a long period of time my my laptop turns off at the end of the day uh, but when it's running in here, if it has a memory leak, it will grow, yeah. it will get, it will crash and it will restart automatically. I got to go back in later and look in Datadog and see that I have a memory problem or it'll let me know that it had happened. But Kubernetes has already fixed it. And uh, that part I really like because now the, the ferocity of this problem has been reduced and I go, okay, I have a memory leak. I need to go solve it. 
Um, I, I will say, though, you got me thinking, Ravi, about one of my stories. The cluster, the cluster isn't going to go away unless <laughs> we had a... Uh, I was working on, with a pilot customer right when we started yeah. SpeedScale, and we were working on some technology that uh, basically it's kind of like a service mesh. And uh, and the way the service meshes work, they run a thing called IP tables. And IP tables messes with the network. And yeah. so uh, if you mess up your IP tables rules and you run it with host networking turn on, then you mess up with the hosts themselves and we actually uh we broke somebody's cluster completely and they were like it's okay this is under infrastructure as code they hit a button and made a new one so it was it was eye-opening to me though because you get so used to how resilient it, it all is yeah. that uh yeah don't play around with ip tables on host networking so that's in yeah our- like it's still there's still like kubernetes like, <laughs> it still requires, like it still requires infra like it's not like you know, it's a good old like op- like open stack, like IaaS versus PaaS. Like it needs somewhere to run. It's not infinite. You know, like there is like, you know, some sort of, well, I'll like most likely there's like, some sort of like Linux infrastructure somewhere that's running it. You know, you have a like, Windows now, but like there, there's there's a piece under it that's running, right? Like it's, people have gotten so easy to like, oh, give me more GKE, click, 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 click. Yeah. But, but Google is in the hard work of like, hey, you know, they configured their IP tables. They used to drop IP tables as... People would yell at me in security. I'm like, oh, I don't know what ports I need. Just not all of them. Like, yeah, no when you need that. That that part, I think the the industry has done a good job catching up. Was security was a little knock on Kubernetes for a while, and uh, it, the clusters are now being built with a lot more security in mind. So things like the networking don't don't allow open access to everything to everybody, including the control plane and stuff. So uh, that a lot of those defaults are a lot more sane. There's a lot better tools for uh, seeing what's going on in your environment. Nice, yeah, great, great talk. I have one more question for you to kind of kind of close this out. Um, and this is this is a good one because uh, I always ask people what they would tell themselves. So imagine you know if it was young Ken, you were walking out of McCormish Pavilion. The day you graduated Georgia Tech, and then you ran to yourself today. Like so, two two of you came into contact. If you came in contact with yourself the day you graduated from Tech, any any advice? You know, don't go to don't go don't get arrested. It could be anything. You know, <laughs> it could be any piece of advice you would just give. Just uh, any any, p- any piece of advice. I think the the number one thing is uh, you so. You actually mentioned it earlier, uh, by the way, Robbie, when mm-hmm. things get too easy, right? Uh, if, if things are easy and you're in the software engineering work and uh, it always worked when you shipped it, right? So shifting into the get into the little more uncomfortable spot where you're always there's a little bit of I'm not sure if this is going to work. That's how you know you're pushing the envelope and then don't give up. So it's, I know it's two pieces of advice, but it's kind of the same thing. So, because what happens is when it's easy, you're not going to give up, okay? But you're also going to tread water, okay? At least for me, I, I want to advance and improve. And so I put myself in tough, uncomfortable positions. And then uh, then that sometimes I feel like, you know, that little voice in the back of my head, hey, man, that's too hard. This, you know, this was a bad idea. So don't give up on it. And, yeah. and and keep at it. And and I think that has worked for me pretty well. And I've taken a bunch of risks in my in my career and uh and I don't I don't regret it. Uh so um yeah, that would be that would be my advice. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thanks, Ken. And if people want to get in touch with you at speed scale, like what's the best way? Um, website, LinkedIn, Twitter, GitHub. Yeah, absolutely. I think I probably use LinkedIn the most. You can yeah. find me, Ken Aarons, uh on LinkedIn or look for speed scale on LinkedIn and drop me a note. And uh, believe it or not, I respond. I read all these things. I respond to people all the time, startup founders that reach out, they say, I got a question. I'll hop on the phone and uh, talk through things we've learned, uh, any kind of way I can help. Uh, that's another thing is uh, always try to help other people out and don't worry about, uh, you know, evening the scales. Uh, um, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of not the point. If you're just helpful to people, karma of the universe you're going to get your returns and, and don't don't sit there and wait for it just uh, just try to be a helpful person so anyway perfect well ken thank you so much for coming on and uh, yeah thanks for your time this afternoon awesome thank you ravi